is Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having a great day. Look, on a lighter note, but something to really truly consider, I'm going to drop some things on you. I'm going to debunk a few myths uh, that come out or are associated with uh, what we saw with the Super Bowl. And it's it's light, but it is actually hopefully illuminating. You know me, I'm all about teaching moments. I'm about learning. I'm about teaching. I'm about evolving. I'm about growth. But let's start with the one thing, the constant narrative that's been spread, especially recently, uh, probably over the last several years, is that the NFL does not play the artists uh, who perform at halftime. And, you know, I've been seeing the memes float around. I've been f seeing a bunch of other things float around. Uh, one of the first things that we have to understand if we're ever going to move outside of our norm when it comes to finance and economics and developing and building wealth and what that truly means and how it's defined is we are going to have to change our thoughts and our uh, understanding in our relationship with money. There's more than one way to compensate someone for something. So when you say I pay somebody for something, the true nature of exchange is compensation. Uh, when we use the word pay, we tend to narrow that down to the exchange of currency uh, and money. And currency as a representation of money is very narrow in the whole scope of how you move and operate. And so when we talk compensation, even when we're talking corporate America and actually taking a job or taking a contractual position with a particular company, the compensation package extends far beyond what you're being paid in dollars. Uh, it could include your insurance package. It could include stock options. It could include a bunch of other things. Uh, it could be uh, access to the company's uh, uh, corporate box at a, a sporting event. It could be access to the company's private jet. It could be a bunch of different things, but it is more than the exchange of money. So then when we look at the Super Bowl in specific, roughly 113 million, somewhere around there, people in the U.S. And uh, I could be wrong on whether it's global or U.S., but I'm almost assuming it is U.S., uh, being that there's roughly 330 some million people in the US and 113 makes about half. So uh, I know it's more than that globally. So 113 million people, 115 million, somewhere up in there. I don't know what the numbers were yesterday, but it's somewhere I'm pretty sure in the one teens. Watch this, right? Okay, now, excuse me, watch this. So. What happens is here's here's the compensation. So you understand it and you understand how to uh, observe and identify opportunities outside of somebody putting cash in your hand. Sometimes what they're offering you may be more valuable than the cash that you would generally get paid for the same thing. Prime example, um, with a 100 teen, whatever that teen is, viewership, people are paying $7 million for a 30 second slot on the Super Bowl. And trust me, they're not paying that $7 million because the metrics come back and say, it really doesn't matter, it really doesn't work, it's not that effective. They're paying it because the metrics over the years have shown that these particular slots have massive impact over brand recognition, brand awareness, buyer choices, and so much more, right? So they're paying $7 million for the 30 seconds they're going to get. The performer on the Super Bowl gets 13 minutes to advertise themselves, to promote themselves, to bring awareness to themselves, to have people searching for them, searching for their brand, searching for their new music, going and streaming their music. 13 minutes unpaid advertising on the most watched event in history. I would almost argue with Ursher strategically moving his album release to two days before the Super Bowl, 
that he's ultimately going to make more money from his appearance on the Super Bowl through the access of that medium uh, than he did in Vegas for over a year. Literally. That's that's the pool. And he got a lot of exposure, but the exposure he got there is global. It's concentrated. It's pushed. It's going to be a conversation for a while. So we have to start being able to look at things and say, you know what? There's something more here. Okay, on to uh, the Alicia Keys uh, vocals. Um, one of the things that coming up and growing up in the church and having, you know, a, a mother who's in the gospel music industry, a brother who's still in the gospel music industry, a nephew who's in it, and just being around music, you start to understand how things work. You have some people who are impeccable. You have some people whose voices are just on point. They never miss. You look for them to miss. I've never heard Luther or Joe Thomas miss a note. And I've seen them live multiple times. Uh, Whitney, before all the stuff went wrong, Prime Whitney, unbelievable. Uh, and there are a bunch of other different people. And if you, uh, man, Daryl Coley, just just sick with vocals. Uh, and then you have a lot of other people who are good at what they do. Alicia Keys is a, a vocalist, to me, secondary. She is a composer. She is a classical and very well-trained pianist. Uh, she has a stage presence uh, and an allure about her. Her vocal talent is her, isn't her lead, but from what I observed, and again, I was around a bunch of dudes and it was crowded, but from what I heard, that first start was, you know, off. And it can be because acoustic sounds, if you ever notice, uh, artists, when they perform in large spaces, they have um, these plugs in the air and what they're doing is they're getting the feedback and it helps them catch their pitch uh, and, find, and, and find their tone and all this other stuff that they keep up with in those things. It's easy to get lost in that. Uh, but the bottom line is this, to me, and, and and it's a personal thing, but what I don't like is judging people based on a level of something that I may not be able to do myself. Um, and so what I do is I say, hey, look, you know, yeah, I want to be entertained. I want some things, but I mean, I think it may, may be something we've made way more bigger than what it is. And I think she recovered. I think that she recovered. She did well. Um, and when I'm looking for vocals, and this is no shot at uh, Alicia Keys, uh, when I'm looking at looking for vocals, when I'm naming my top 10, Alicia Keys isn't in it. So I'm not expecting perfection. I'm expecting performance. And I think she delivered on that. The next thing is everybody's taking a shot and saying, hey, man, it's what it is. And I've got my mixed things about Ursha, but that's a personal thing. Um, the dude is an entertainer. He brings pop and he brings a lot of pop. He, I mean, and when I say pop, I'm not talking about the genre. I'm talking about how hard it hits. He delivers. He takes you places. He makes you reminisce. Uh, he has uh, good vocal range, uh, especially with all the movement and activity that's going on simultaneously. The guy takes you from dancing to skating to all of this. He brought on some of uh, the recognized and uh, renowned in 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 the A, and he to me he he delivered and represented his brand well. I think it was a good performance. Um, it depends on what you're comparing it against. You know, uh, every performance is different. Nobody's going to be Mike. Nobody's going to be Prince. Um, <laughs> You know, but everybody leaves an indelible imprint. I think that he did well. But again, my opinion. I have no problem with people having opinions. What I have a problem with is how we always seem to find the negative in everything. Sometimes it's just like, you know. And I heard the and I heard 
the crack with Alicia just like everybody else did. And I'm like, oh, to myself, damn. But I didn't go for the juggler. Everybody, I mean, I just hear people, you know, that wasn't all that good. That wasn't, that. and I, I get it. Everybody's got their opinion, but I'm very careful about where I allow my mind to go. So if it's something that I'm looking at and it's not to where I think it should be, I don't give it attention. Because if I give it attention, that draws me to a place to where I have to go off of my frequency, off of my vibration to sit up and focus on something negative rather than sitting up saying, this is a good game or, you know, whatever. Focus on something positive or just get away from it. But we've got to stop giving our attention to being negative about, you know, whatever. And I'm not saying give somebody a pass for shoddy show. And if somebody really, truly is not delivering on the show, ain't nothing wrong with telling people, hey, man, this is what I think. But just the constant way we will find a way to do it. And I don't know what you measure things against, but we've got to be careful with that. Uh, I'm not touching the whole uh, JD thing, man. I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, that's, that's for a whole nother segment some other time if I decide to touch it. Um, but I wanted to touch on those things that I think that first and foremost, if it was up to me, I would be looking for a way to create our own spaces. 70% 70, 70 of the talent in the league is black. We dominate the stage when it comes to performing, uh, in events like this and so, so much more. Um, but I will leave with this. It's a bunch of people that don't look like us that are hot as hell behind the Black National Anthem being played or sung at an event that is taking place in Black History Month. Um, and this started, I think, last last Super Bowl. But people, they, they going in and they're triggered. My whole thing is don't give it no energy. Don't waste your time. Uh, the worst thing I think we can do is give time and energy to things that we shouldn't be shocked by. We need to get out of the mindset of the narrative that's being pushed that we're in a post-racial America, first and foremost. Now, I'm not saying that we need to use race as a means or of excuse for not performing and not delivering and not accomplishing, but we must be aware of the fact that the obstacles and the resistance and the push is there. Never get caught off guard. Don't spend your time trying to explain something to someone that should be intelligent enough, mature enough, and experienced enough to know because either they are in denial, running game, or stupid. And either way, that's not your job to convince them. Your job is to step up. Your job is to perform. Your job is to deliver. Your job is to achieve. Our job as a people is to come together and love one another. Our job as a people is to unite and stand in unity with one another. Our job as a people is to see the opportunities that are before us and capitalize on them. What I would like to see is the capitalization of opportunities where we get the people that we live vicariously through so intensively to become more of a part of the problem solving element and component to be more like some of the celebrities that were in the civil rights movement. And this is definitely not me challenge championing uh, a lot of the think um, and group think and group thought of the civil rights movement. But this is me talking about you had your Sam Cooks and Otis Reddings and uh, the uh, Jimi Hendrix and those guys who were funding major movements of empowerment. Uh, many believe the reason for their deaths is, is that. So, you know, that's what I would like to see. I would like to see us be in a place where we can celebrate one another, that we can hold people who have platforms that benefit from our dollar accountable. And in, in truth, we should be holding them accountable, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether um, uh, any of that. I think that's one of the things that we love to do. We love to call out ours and we give them passes. I'm about, look, if you're spending your money, you should get what you think you uh, are paying for. 
And if not, there should be some type of remedy to that situation. And so therefore I am, you know, pushing for that. But yeah, man, um, we need to wake up in awareness. That's why I created uh, the Legacy Wealth Academy for the purpose of that. After I wrote uh, the book, um, well, my mind just slipped. <laughs> After I wrote my 25th book, was it 25th, 25th book, which was um, The War on Black Wealth, I followed that with uh, finally unveiling a course that I had been working on for years, which is the um, Plan for Generational Wealth. And I did that because we need to be aware of how things work. I think one of the things, and I've been very consistent in this message that keeps us at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder is that we don't understand how things work. We tend to operate with a superficial knowledge of what we see and what we observe and we never peel back the layers. We never dig deep. We never go beyond what we've always known. And we're trying to solve um, highly complex equations with, with simplistic uh, cultural math and it's not making sense. I think that we are going to have to develop a, a more acute awareness of how things work if we're ever going to overcome the things that we're facing and everything that we're facing has a solution. I've spent my adult life revealing, sharing, learning, teaching, researching, developing, so that we could get to a point, so that we could take all of the things that the minds of the past and the present have invested in and bring it into a place to where we start to extract solutions to our problems. And it comes a point in time where we have to stop complaining and start taking action. Um, and again, my opinion is just my opinion. So you have a right not to like the Super Bowl. That wasn't my point. My point was more in the fact that I think we are naturally driven towards being negative, to seeing what went wrong versus seeing what went right. And that translates into our everyday life. If you are a person that does that, you will focus on the things that are wrong in front of you at work, in your family, in your marriage, in your relationship with your kids, in your relationship with your parents, and you'll find yourself constantly at odds with the things you really truly want and desire in life because you are focusing on the negative. You're focusing on the things that are wrong versus focusing on what's right, focusing on something positive, focusing on the answer, focusing on the solution, focusing on the brighter things and the lighter things because whatever you focus on, you feel. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Um, happy Monday, uh, Money Monday. Happy uh, beginning of the week. Uh, this week is going to be what you make it. Uh, as an individual, as a part of your family, as a part of your community, as a part of your race, as a part of this nation and the human race, it's going to be what you make it. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I want to thank you for sharing your time with me. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Yeah. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be